Good afternoon. This is Greg Lois. I'm an attorney and the managing partner of the Lois Law Firm. We are a New York and New Jersey uh, workers' compensation defense law firm, 21 attorneys defending employers in New York and New Jersey. If you're with us today, it's to learn a little bit about uh, defending repetitive use injury claims and occupational exposure claims in New York. Thanks for joining us. Let's dive right in. New York recognizes three essential uh, injury types, and those could be physical traumatic losses, and we typically think of those as specific accidents. This is where the claimant falls from a ladder, has a slip and fall, has a lifting injury, something specific. New York also recognizes mental injuries, uh, and those could be injuries, all types of mental illnesses, psychiatric disability, resulting from a physical trauma, or they could be purely mental. Mel mental. So New York does rent, uh, recognize a mental mental uh, cause of action, and that would be for an extraordinary or peculiar exposure to something uh, which then resulted in a psychiatric illness. And finally, New York also recognizes that there can be occupational cumulative exposure claims or repetitive cumulative trauma claims. Uh, typically, we'll see these on an assembly line where uh, the workers are claiming that because of the nature of the work uh, and the repetitive uh, motions they're required to do, they all develop a very specific type of orthopedic injury. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the occupational injury definition, which uh, finds that these types of injuries, even if they do not result from a specific accident, can be compensable if they result from the nature of the employment and are caused by a distinctive feature of the employment. And that is important to take away as the sort of second requirement for these claims. And the reason I say that is because uh, things like walking, standing, being exposed to inclines, uh, heat, cold, uh, these are not distinctive features of any one employment. Any employment, uh, particularly those outdoor employments, can expose someone to extremes of temperature, indoors and outdoors, uh, can expose them to changes in humidity. That is not a distinctive feature of any single employment. It could be a, a distinctive feature of many employments. And for that reason, uh, you can dispute the compensability of those claims. Uh, we typically deny occupational exposure and cumulative injury cases, and that is because uh, there are typically good legal defenses, both within the statute itself, the relevant case law, and also because, uh, because of the nature of these injuries and often the way that they are reported to the employer or carrier, uh, specific legal defenses may be implicated. Those defenses include the statute of limitations. As you know, New York has a two-year state uh, statute of limitations uh, for bringing a workers' compensation claim. Uh, now, that statute of limitations uh, begins on the date of last exposure or the date of disablement, and that's when the injury became manifest and became disabling. Uh, we also will dispute whether the medical evidence really demonstrates causal relationship uh, between the alleged injury and the specific employment. Further, uh, we will often uh, find that these, this employee uh, has had numerous exposures through long periods of employment with other employers and where there's other periods of coverage. And for that reason, we will often seek apportionment in these claims. So let's talk a little bit further about these specific legal defenses. The first one is the statute of limitations. Uh, the, the statute of limitations is, begins to run uh, at the time the employee knew or should have known that the alleged condition was due to the employment. What that really means uh, is when the employee first started seeking treatment for it and was told or told the treating physician uh, that this condition is related to the employment. Uh, nothing's more frustrated than an employee uh, who brings a claim a decade after they've been separated from the employment. And then we look back, we look at their medical records and we see that they were telling their doctor five years ago, 10 years ago, um, you know, maybe a decade after their separation from the employment, but a decade before they brought the workers' compensation claim, uh, that they are having trouble breathing. And oh, by the way, I worked in the factory uh, that exposed me to asbestos. And for that reason, or, or some other uh, circumstance, and, and they're telling the doctor all through the course of treatment uh, that they had a condition which they believed was due to the employment. They can also bring uh, their claim within two years of the date they were disabled. 
And if there is no time that the employee knew or should have known, then the date of disablement will control the statute of limitations. Now, this is important uh, because uh, we'll use our medical discovery to determine when the condition was known to the claimant and when the claimant uh, was starting to report it to their employer as they believed when they knew uh, that it was related to the employment. And, and the reason I think that's important is because uh, there have been numerous cases where there's been exposure claims in which the claimant says, I was exposed to X, Y, and Z in my building. And maybe they know in our location, we did a remediation where there was a moment when we were taking out the asbestos tiles or other uh, stuff in the location. They had a medical condition which became manifest and evident. They were seeking care for it and they told the doctor they believed it was related to the employment and even told the doctor, oh, by the way, we just had this big asbestos remediation in the employment. I think that's an argument for a statute of limitations defense. There is nothing further that the claimant needed to know. Uh, they're act under active care. They're reporting that they believe it was due to the employment, and they're even discussing specific things that were present in the employment. Uh, and so for that reason, that would be a valid statute of limitations defense. Uh, the date of last exposure is generally the date the employee first lost time from work or the last time they worked there. Uh, most of the occupational exposure cases I see are the uh, cases in which the claimant has been out of the employment for several years, a uh, condition manifests, and now they decide to bring a workers' compensation claim. Just remember, an employee may be entitled to workers' compensation benefits for permanent residual disability and medical treatment, even if there has been no lost time from the employment. When we're considering whether or not there is actual exposure, I always caution my clients uh, to consider, particularly in cases where the employee has not been in the employment for years and years and years, or maybe we don't even have that location anymore. We shut the location down 10 years ago, and now we're starting to get uh, claims from this location. I always remind my clients that even though the facility may be destroyed, even though the records may be gone, uh, and maybe there is no union or other uh, uh, employee group which is maintaining their own uh, independent safety records, Remember that there may have been OSHA reporting, OSHA incidents reported, there may have been NIOSH testing, there may have been air sampling or industrial hygiene reports or studies which were registered or filed with the state or federal government. Um, and certainly all of those things can come out later uh, to talk about uh, whether or not there was actual ex exposure in the employment. Of course, uh, to the extent that we can preserve any of these records and have some knowledge of what's gone on in the facility that's very useful. Oftentimes, and particularly in situations where employees are being coached by their attorneys, uh, they will have uh, uh, specific statements about how they were exposed. And that's maybe because they know that there was OSH studies or an OSH report made saying, hey, we had this one chemical or something in our facility and they'll all of a sudden, everybody will claim that they were uh, taking breaks in the room where we stored this one hazardous substance so that they can uh, try to allege that their claims are work related. Certainly, we'll need some information from the location in order to dispute those claims. Uh, not on this list, but very important are MSDA sheets for all of the uh, uh, substances and uh, chemicals that we have in our employment. All right, um, let's talk a little bit about how we dispute medicals. So causal relationship is very important uh, point for us to refute. Now, oftentimes the causal relationship statements provided by the claimant will be essentially net in nature. It'll be the claimant telling their physician, hey, I was exposed to this in the employment or this is what I did in the employment. And the physician simply parroting those statements into their medical records which then becomes the basis of a finding of causal relationship by the judge of compensation. So we believe that obtaining a good and solid independent medical examination, or in the case of a deceased employee in which the case is brought as a dependency claim, that the uh, uh, obtaining a forensic report is key to the successful defense of these types of cases. It is important to provide our evaluator with the employee's complete medical history, uh, anything that we have from the employment, um, and certainly anything that shows that the condition was pre-existing or arose during a period of prior employment is useful for both our IME evaluator or forensic evaluator. Again, uh, the burden will then fall to us once the judge has found that there is prima facie medical evidence of a causally related condition to refute this. And frankly, 
uh, the judge will simply accept the net opinion of the claimant's physician, because oftentimes the treating physician will be treating the claimant years after they've been departed from the employment, or if they're still working for us, and just simply accept whatever the claimant says, and they'll simply uh, accept it and say, oh, the claimant says they did this, that, and the other thing in the employment, and now they have uh, elbow tendonitis. Well, it must be related. There's nothing more net than that statement. It's just simply adopting the claimant's uh, complaints and then saying this is my uh, finding. So for those reasons, we do believe an a IME is necessary to dispute these findings. Okay, apportionment. Another use of the IME may be to uh, provide grounds and an argument and a basis for us to argue for apportionment. Section 44 of our workers' compensation law states that where the last employer is found liable, they may seek apportionment from prior employers uh, who expose the employee to the same condition uh, or uh, environmental uh, circumstances which led to the alleged occupational disease. Um, remember, of course, that osis injuries like silicosis are not apportionable and it can be found directly against the last employer. Let's talk about some tactics for defending these cases and let's get into some specific uh, remember, uh, most workers' compensation occupational exposure claims and repetitive use injuries should be disputed and denied. And the reason for this is because the burden falls upon the claimant to demonstrate that the employment effort was extraordinary and uh, peculiar to that employment and led to this condition. Remember, the natural effects of aging, uh, the natural deterioration of joints is not compensable. I have employers who accept cases from claimants who say, well, I've got bad hips and it's because I walk around from station to station during the day. Well, you walk in any employment, any facility, there's nothing specific to this employment uh, that exposes you to additional uh, 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 circumstances that could lead to that condition and therefore that case should be denied. So. Most workers' compensation cases in New York involving occupational exposures, alleged repetitive use, uh, should be denied, which means they go onto the rocket docket. Uh, New York has a what we're calling a rocket docket uh, because it is an extremely short period of time from when a controversy is raised by the employer or carrier to the final decision in the case. And it's approximately 60 days if every single landmark in a rocket docket case is actually met. Um, statistically, when we deny a case within 28 days, uh, again, that's statistics provided to us by the Workers' Compensation Board. The matter will be listed for what's called a pre-hearing conference. At that pre-hearing conference, uh, the judge will hear both sides and attempt to limit the proofs. The matter will then be sent down for testimony. Uh, the testimony must conclude uh, within 60 days and a decision in, rendered by the Workers' Compensation and Law Judge. So very short period of time. Our goal, of course, is to remove the case from the rocket docket. It never inures to the benefit of the employer uh, or any party really seeking to obtain the truth and present proofs, and particularly in cases involving complex issues of causation and exposure, uh, to have the case on the rocket docket. So first step one is for your defense attorney to invoke uh, Section 38 of the rules and argue that the case should be removed from the rocket docket because it is complicated, involves alleged occupational exposure, and therefore is not appropriate for a quick adjudication. Next, there needs to be a consideration and as a real circling of the defense team. And this would be uh, people from the employment location, co-employees, supervisors, managers. We really wanna take a, a thought about whether or not the claim makes sense and if it can be defended on exposure. Uh, my default position, of course, is to take the defense position on exposure and require the claimant to demonstrate their uh, actual exposure. However, I do have some employers um, who will say, Greg, look, uh, due to the nature of our work, we do expect a certain percentage of our workforce to develop a repetitive use condition. And for that reason, we accept maybe an elbow claim or wrist claims uh, based on that because we've just seen that incidence in our employment and they have a strategy in place to get quick uh, good, excellent medical care in place for those employees and get that matter treated. Really what I'm talking about is cases in which the exposure is really tenuous and the claims are really vague and subjective or where we've reviewed the claims and the medical records and the claimant is really exaggerating or magnifying their alleged exposures in order to try to pull something in from their personal uh, health history or something that could potentially be congenital and make it uh, uh, workers' compensation. Uh, compensable. So uh, really considering that and then making that determination as a group and thinking about 
uh, how best to defend the cases. Um, in death cases, and many of these claims come about post-death uh, as dependency claims, remember that in every accidental death, uh, every unexplained death, every suspicious death, there's going to be a autopsy. Uh, where there is an autopsy, of course, we, the employer, can get an independent one. But in occupational exposure claims or claims in which the claimant succumbs to a respiratory uh, distress or they've had a long history of cancer, which they finally succumb to, uh, there is rarely an autopsy. So in most of my dependency claims that involve occupational exposures or alleged occupational exposures, there is no autopsy. So what we're doing is getting a forensic evaluation done. Um, in the uh, typical case, we're going to help the employer and carrier select the appropriate independent medical evaluator. Uh, we are going to prepare, I, I prefer to prepare the IME cover letters. Uh, we want to make sure that we are putting everything out there in terms of the claimant's full and complete medical history so that our evaluator has enough information to base their opinion on and have it be reasonable. Uh, in the forensic situations, I'm going to be communicating with the forensic evaluator uh, because, remember, those are not subject to the same limitations on communication between defense counsel and the uh, forensic evaluator. And I'm going to request advice on how I should best cross the uh, treating physician, uh, where the weaknesses are in that physician's often net opinion. And finally, we will sometimes consider the impartial expert. New York does uh, maintain a impartial expert board. Uh, these physicians are allegedly impartial, um, and where there are issues where the judge really has problems determining which expert, uh, the expert, for example, called by the defense and an expert called by the claimant is most credible, they can, of course, uh, appoint an impartial expert. Uh, my uh, review of the impartial expert list uh, is that it is skewed towards physicians who I think are more paternalistic or more uh, claimant friendly. Uh, however, that is something to be considered as to whether that would be useful for furthering the defense of the case. All right. Um, you know, thinking about how we're going to handle the case and uh, queue it up best uh, to be resolved through the litigation process. Uh, remember that you have the opportunity to try these cases all the way to judgment. And that's important to consider because uh, sometimes, and particularly in these types of matters, they're complicated. Uh, we're going to have expert witnesses, sometimes forensic expert witnesses, and remember that in New York, uh, appealable issues obtain the tactical advantage of an appeal that stays the payment of any money, which gives us a leverage point or a point to consider uh, when it comes time to try to resolve or settle these cases. Of course, these claims can be dismissed, and there are various reasons for them to be dismissed, uh, statute of limitations grounds, notice grounds, uh, lack of causal relationship grounds, etc., more typically, these matters are resolved by way of lump sum dismissal. New York allows for a settlement compromise with a complete release of future medical and any other uh, benefit, uh, including death benefits, which would be uh, pursuant to Section 32. Of course, in the circumstance where the claimant has uh, not is alive, uh, this is the absolutely the best way to go in terms of resolving the matter, and you'd be looking for a lump sum dismissal. All right. I hope this was useful. Uh, we went through this topic, which could be complicated pretty quickly. Unfortunately, this month, um, this uh, presentation is recorded in advance, so I can't take questions, but please feel free to email me or text me with your questions, and I'll get back to you as soon as I can. Next month, we're going to talk about independent medical evaluations. Uh, we're going to meet on the third Monday in October, which is Monday, October 15th. Please join us for that. Okay. Hope everybody has a great day and a great week. Bye.